Hey viewers, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today's video is on the network and data infrastructure for the house of what I've done. And uh, also kind of, this delves a little bit into uh, a home lab for those of you who know what that is. And, and so I uh, figured I'd take you through uh, the network rack here and show you all the equipment and how I have everything set up. And um, hopefully you'll find it useful or at least uh, entertaining. Uh, so we'll start at the top. Recall from previous videos, there are all of the CAT6 lines coming in. Uh, the blue are general data drops, uh, the orange are PoE, and the purple are uh, surveillance cameras, which are also PoE. And then likewise, that junction box there have all of the lines coming in from the outside. So we can see here right now, we've got two. We've got the campus fiber, as I'll call it, uh, 12 strands. Six pair, so six pairs, six different drops uh, coming in. Um, only one of them is actually hot. Uh, the rest I haven't hooked up the other side yet. So that's a that's a future project for another day. Uh, and then we've got the gray cable here is the DSL line um, from the DSL provider. And you'll notice I've tried to cable manage everything. Uh, hook and loop Velcro straps are the way to go here. It just makes things so much nicer. Um, so. Uh, those lines coming in, you can see they're going to this top patch panel here. It's just a keystone patch panel, um, right? And so here's the DSL line coming in with just a RJ11 connection. And then over here, all the fiber lines in uh, LC connectors. Um, again, for this kind of thing, I think keystone patch panels are the way to go because at least the way I have my rack set up, I've got all the stuff coming in from outside the, the room uh, on that top panel, and it can be, you know, disparate things, right? I've got LC connectors here, I've got DSL here. Whenever I get fiber soon, I hope, you know, whatever connector that's gonna come in on, you know, I'll need a, I want a keystone for that. So it allows, you know, that big variety of, of being able to patch in what I need to with whatever connector. Moving down, you see a, a 48 port patch panel. Um, and that just basically connects to, to all of those, all the blue cables right there. Um, and that connects to uh, every drop in the house. Um, on this particular one, I've got, I think, well, let's look and see. I've got a few spares left, all right? I've got one spare downstairs. So I've got this actually organized too. Uh, the top row is upstairs, the bottom row is downstairs. I figured I'd keep it simple that way. So I've got one spare port on the downstairs and then I've got one, two, three, four. I've got four spare ports on the upstairs and I pretty much have plans for all those already. So that I will probably be maxing that out um, pretty soon. But I had extra patch panel or extra patch cables and so I figured I'd just connect everything just to, just cause you know, why not? Um, you'll also see here uh, for these cables, these black cables, those are, uh, those go to my office for dedicated ports for all of my work computers. So I work from home and so I've got those on their own separate VLAN and completely isolated from the rest of the network. <clears throat> and so I figure I, I color coded them. I color coded the Keystone Jacks in the office too as black, just to have a, <clears throat> just to have a, um, you know, an easy way to identify, right? So uh, I guess moving down, we've got Ubiquity. All the stuff is Ubiquity as far as the, all the switch gear. So Ubiquity this is a US 48, uh, it's a Gen 1 48 port gigabit switch. No PoE on this one, just your plain gigabit switch. And then it also has two SFP plus ports that'll run 10 gig, and then two regular SFP ports that'll run one gig. So in this case, I've got one fiber line here, patched in here, that will eventually feed uh, the network rack going upstairs to support the crypto mining operation as an uplink. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, so that's what that's for, and then the, uh, the 10 gig SFP plus port here is going to the uh, 10 gig core switch, which we'll get to in a moment for an uplink. And then this uh, one gig SFP plus is connecting the, the uh, next switch down, the PoE switch. Um, and then I've got one 10 gig spare port here for whatever. Um, I tentatively have it slated for um, the uh, network NVR for whenever I actually get the surveillance up and going. Moving on down, we have another patch panel. Uh, this patch panel I've got dedicated just to surveillance. It's a 24 port, uh, but I've really only got uh, 12 provisioned uh, for 12 uh, cameras here. And I think I only have wired maybe 
uh, 11. I don't exactly remember. So I, it gives me the option where if I want more cameras in the future, I can, you know, add another switch or a bigger switch or something, and, and I've got space to, to um, expand with the cameras. And then likewise down here, right, mirroring it, I've got all the PoE lines. And these run, most of the PoE right now is <clears throat> just access points. So five of these are, are <clears throat> Wi-Fi access points. And then um, I've got a few drops behind TVs for future expansion if I need PoE behind a TV for a device. And then um, this yellow here, <clears throat> again, color code, this is actually powering the Ring base station. So if you recall my previous video, I did, uh, I did one showing you can take your Ring Alarm base station and power it using PoE so that you didn't have to have a nasty wall wart hanging out you know, of the wall and everything like that. And so I've got that one yellow. <clears throat> and all these colors, right, that I've got are corresponding not only to some of the cable types, but also to the network configuration. So I've got everything VLAN on, on, on separate VLANs, mostly. Some of, there's some overlap between color of cable and VLAN identifier, but I went ahead and actually named the VLANs with colors in the Ubiquiti software just to... It, it helps it helps it keep straight in my head, uh, for better or for worse. Um, so that's that's why you'll see some of the other colors as we as we go along, right? So uh, this next switch, this is my uh, PoE switch. So it's a Ubiquiti Gen One, 24 port gigabit PoE, right? And I've got it tentatively allocated 12 ports for surveillance, 12 ports for PoE, and then it has two one gig SFP plus ports or SFP ports, one gig. So this first one here, that is actually feeding the gate switch. So you recall I ran a fiber line to my front gate and I've got out there, I've got an eight port uh, PoE switch. It's the smallest one I could get that still had uh, fiber, you know, had SFP in it, right? So I could run fiber to it. Um, so that's actually in a weatherproof box at my gate switch and it's not doing anything right now, but it is up and running as you can see by the link lights. So, um, so that was nice to actually see the fiber working on that long of a run. So that's what's feeding that. And then this other SFP plus or SFP port connection, right? This is that uplink to the previous switch, as you can see. Um, where I talked about the, you know, this patch panel. I have a blanking plate here, uh, mainly a space provision to where if I need to add more PoE, like I mentioned, another switch, I've got a slot right here and I don't have to reconfigure the world. And I've got plenty of rack space since this rack is 42U. Uh, moving on down, we have the, what is this? This is, Ubiquity, um, what do they call this? This is called the switch aggregator or aggregator switch. So this little doodad is basically the cheapest 10 gig switch that Ubiquity has. This gives me eight 10 gig SFP plus ports. So as you can see, I've got four of them feeding uh, four fiber lines that are ultimately slated for the, going to my shop. And then I've got um, one of these that is the uplink to the um, right to the 48 port switch that I showed you earlier. The other is the downlink or uplink, however you want to say it, uh, to the router. And then these other two are feeding uh, two servers, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Moving down, we've got the uh, UDM Pro uh, Ubiquity. So this is the router. So this router has, um, I guess we'll start here. It's got first one 10 gig SFP plus output to feed the rest of the network. And so that's connecting to that, that core switch right there, All right? And then we have two inputs for internet. So this will actually support uh, dual ISPs. I've got just a, um, see here. I've got a, just a standard gigabit ethernet here, and then I've got a 10 gig SFP plus port. So this will actually support 10 gig ethernet uh, if and whenever it becomes available and I want to pay for it. Right now we're running DSL, so just we're just using the copper connection because it's more than enough. It also has a built-in um, eight port gigabit switch, um, which is handy. Uh, it should be noted that while this is eight ports a gigabit, the actual switching backplane on this thing will only support one gigabit of total throughput. So you can split your connections a lot, but it really has low throughput on bandwidth, right? So, um, I am using this as kind of low band for low bandwidth devices. So in my case, what I have plugged in here, all the green are for uh, iDRAC, for Dell servers or uh, IPMI interfaces for remote management for servers. 
So I've got all those plugged in here and on a separate VLAN. And then I've got, um, I've got these other two are, one's a server, one is, and the other two are equipment I'm gonna talk about in a minute, my TV tuner and my um, home automation Z-Wave hub. All that stuff, very low bandwidth requirements. So it, it made sense just to utilize the switch to put them in there. Cause honestly, I didn't have anywhere else to, to hook them up. So, And then the UDM Pro uh, also has a hard drive bay uh, for cameras, um, you know, so you can at least have one drive to, to do something with cameras. Uh, I had an extra, like an old one and a half tear Western digital green that I threw in there. I don't have any cameras installed yet, so it's not really doing anything, but I figured day I'll at least fill the space and where I can make use of it later. Uh, <clears throat> going down below, a little whisker panel just to, to feed the cables through to try to make it a little cleaner. <clears throat> now we have a rack shelf. And you will see we've got, this is the DSL modem. This came from my uh, my provider, right? Uh, so that's, it is what it is. I couldn't, I hadn't have any choice on this. This is what they gave me. And so it's it's literally DSL in and then that white cable, right? Ethernet out um, to the rest of the system. Then here we've got an HD home run network uh, TV tuner. So again, you've got yellow here uh, for, uh, this is on like an IOT VLAN, so it's, it's segregated from the rest of the network, right? Since all this thing really needs to do is contact the internet, maybe, and then serve up a, a service, right? It doesn't need to access anything else. So I've got this guy, you know, network TV tuner, right? I, these are pretty popular. This gives me two, two uh, tuners inside this box, and I run this along with Plex to get over the air, um, over the air signals for, for TV and for DVR. And you can see we've got the coax coming out here and that, that feeds up uh, all the way into the attic to an antenna. And then the other op, the other uh, box here is, this is a Hubitat uh, and this is a smart home hub. So this guy has Z-Wave and Zigbee built in. This is one of the, one of the few like open hubs where it, it doesn't lock you into one ecosystem. Like this thing supports about everything and it will also play ball with Home Assistant uh, for home automation. And so this was this was kind of my choice. If I had to do it again, I would probably go with a Z-Wave USB stick for Home Assistant, which I'll talk about Home Assistant in a little bit. But this is, uh, this is a good option, especially if you want a plug and play with no servers or anything, home automation solution but you don't want to be tied to any one ecosystem like smart things or whatever. Uh, this guy's a good choice, I think. So that's, that's what he, that's what he's doing. Um, next up KVM. So I picked this guy up cheap on eBay. Uh, this is a, just a HP TFT 7600, uh, KVM. Uh, and it looks like, oh, cool. looks like the server didn't boot. So it's not going to work. So I figured it was nice to have a, a KVM in the rack um, and I got it for fairly cheap. So I went ahead and put that in there. That guy is connected to the first server. So this is a Dell R410, uh, really low power, single CPU, low memory. Um, I am using it, it's running a Ubuntu 20 desktop uh, with a GUI. I'm using it mainly as a KVM, so I've got that running with this uh, this uh, built you know rack mount monitor, and um, I'm running the uh, guacamole service to access everything else. So I kind of got this server as just a hub to um, to manage the other servers from within the rack because I got I got them cheap enough and it doesn't use too much power. And I also ended up using it uh, to um, for ripping DVDs. So it does have a DVD drive. So I got it set up to. Um, trip DVDs as well. I tried that on the next server, but apparently this DVD drive is messed up somehow. So, uh, but this one worked. So that's that's all he's doing, and it gives me a, a a Linux GUI desktop that I can use for whatever, right? He so he's pretty well underutilized. He is one of the other gigabit connections here. I didn't want to 10 gig him because he just doesn't deserve it. He doesn't do much. So uh, that's what he's doing. Next up. Dell R420. Uh, this guy is one of the workhorses. So this guy's running Proxmox, which is a, a virtualization, and I'm probably running about 10 VMs on this guy. Uh, he's a 
dual hex core xenon inside with uh, I don't even know how much RAM now. I think uh, 60 gigs of RAM. Um, again, all these used enterprise servers. Like these are decade old servers, but that you can get them cheap on eBay. Are they the most power efficient? No. But is it good value per horsepower? Absolutely, for what you need to do. So he's running all the VMs. So I'm running lots of VMs. I'm running uh, Pi Hole for DNS routing and and uh, ad blocking and bad site blocking and that kind of stuff. Uh, I am running Plex for a media server. I'm running Home Assistant for home automation. I've got um, a variety of other things on there. Uh, on the crypto world, I'm running a storage server, S-T-O-R-J. Uh, I'm running a storage node for decentralized um, cloud storage. And so uh, Proxmox is running these two drives in a, um, a ZFS mirror. And then over here, these two drives, these are three, uh, a, a ZFS mirror of three terabyte drives. And I'm running those for the storage node, passing those drives through to the VM. And so that, uh, again, trying to do as much kind of passive income as I can, you know, because it's, it's cheap and why not? And am I making a lot? No, I'm not, but it doesn't hurt to try. And it's kind of fun to mess with for, for my mind. So uh, future plans for this, uh, maybe setting up a Bitcoin Lightning node to run on this. Um, I'm also, oh, I'm also running a, since we're talking crypto, I'm running a pre-search node on this. So there's a, a decentralized search engine called pre-search, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, if you don't want, if you don't like Google and all the, all the tracking and bad stuff that, you know, they like to do, uh, pre-search is a good alternative and it kind of, it basically has decentralized nodes around the world that, that you know, run all your search queries and, and, and provide the horsepower. So uh, that's what this guy is contributing to that ecosystem. And so making a little bit off of that too, which is nice. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that R420, that is all things Proxmox. Um, future state, I may add another server, you know, maybe in the upstairs rack, do some high availability or something like that just to play around. It's kind of a fun thing. So we shall see. But for now, this thing works beautifully. Uh, last server in the rack, Dell R510. This is a 12 bay 2U server, and this is the NAS. So this is running uh, TrueNAS Core, and it is populated with, uh, so the first six are running 450 gigs. The second six are running, uh, oh, the first six are running three, three tear each, and the next six are running 450 gigs. So I've got two V devs here. Each V dev is in a RAID Z2, so that out of this, each cluster of six drives, I can have two drives fail in each cluster before I lose data. So all of that combined, that gives me about, uh, that gives me about 12 tear of storage right now, which is enough for what I need uh, for running Plex and movies and, and, t and all that kind of stuff, right? We've got my entire media library is ripped on the server. So it's really handy to have all that in one spot and not have to shuffle disks. So, um, and that thing has been working rock solid. And I guess it's worth knowing these two servers are connected with uh, 10 gig connections. I put 10 gig cards in them. And um, so they're running 10 gig connections. Um, the Proxmox server also has a Quadro P400 graphics card to handle video transcoding and hardware. So it doesn't peg the CPUs to do that. Um, so that's about it for servers. Uh, coming on down, I've got a uh, just a power strip with switches. And I, I like these because if I ever want to power cycle on something that doesn't have an on off switch. So the cable modem, the, uh, you know, the Z wave box, the DVR box or the, you know, uh, tuner box, right? Those are not power switches. You just pull the plug. And so rather than having to get behind there and fiddle with cables, right? I can just flip a switch. So I, I like that. So that's why I'm running this. Also noted here, I've got the ubiquity, uh, smart outlet. This guy's pretty cool. What he does, I've got hooked up to my DSL modem. So what he does is he's connected via Wi-Fi to the Ubiquiti ecosystem. And if if uh, Ubiquiti detects that the internet goes down for some length of time, that thing will automatically power cycle my uh, DSL modem to try to recover. So, which most of the time that, that's the kind of thing where it'll work. So that's a cool little automation that, uh, that's, that I like, it's nice to have. Uh, and finally, at the bottom, we've got the UPSs, a little dirty. So I have a pair of 
uh, trip light UPSs. Um, and I've got the loads fairly evenly split on this. Um, most of those servers have dual power supply, so I've got, you know, one supply to each of the UPSs. Uh, that's how I have it wired, and I've tried to split the network infrastructure a little bit on, you know, between the two. Uh, it could be done a little better, but for now it's fine. I mean, and all of this is running on one 20 amp circuit dedicated. If I ever needed to add more power, then I would add another 20 amp circuit, right? And then I put one of these on one circuit, one of these on the other, you know, so. Um, but for now, this works just fine. Um, and then I think uh, some of you will probably ask, how much is all this, you know, electricity cost? And I think, uh, so looking at the load there, you can see it. I'm running about 650 watts right now is what all of this is pulling, the whole rack. So that's not terrible, I don't think. I mean, granted, this is kind of idle. I'm not, I'm not pegging CPUs or anything, or, but I'm happy with it. It's fine. It, Electricity is fairly cheap, so it does what needs to have, does what I need it to. And then the last is a big empty space. So I left that space at the bottom for a air conditioner. So Trip Light makes a Rack 9 air conditioner that I think eventually I will want to have because I know when I shut this door, it gets pretty toasty in here, which is really good for, you know, making sure if pipes don't freeze. But in the summer, I don't know if we'll have issues or not. We will see. And so ideally I want to keep the door closed. And so um, future state would be to add that air conditioner. Uh, what else? Uh, cable management. I'm just going to kind of pan and show you what I did for cable management. It isn't the prettiest, but it's way better than it was. Um, I am really limited on space. As you can see, you can see how close my rails and network rack are to the, to the back. So like auto cable management arms and stuff are not happening. So the compromise I made was cable manage it all and make it pretty here. And then if I need to pull a server, I'll have to disconnect everything from the back of the server and then slide the server out. That's, that's my concession. That's the only way I know to do it. Um, so, but at least everything's kind of bundled and tied and that so far that's working out pretty well. Um, along the lines of cable management, I mentioned Velcro, uh, ties, very important, very nice to do. Buy a big roll of it on Amazon for like 20 bucks and it'll last you forever. Um, the other thing, and you may saw this on the previous video of, uh, of the 3D printer, but I printed a bunch of these cable management brackets. These, these I actually had to customize a bit to make them short so they fit in here, right? Um, uh, where's the other? Like these, oh, sorry, bad camera. Like that one right there, all right? All these cable management brackets I 3D printed. Uh, so awesome, because if I were gonna buy something like this, I mean, I'd pay 10 bucks a pop for them. They're ridiculously expensive, but I print them for a few cents. And I mean, it's it's holding cables. It doesn't need to do much, right? It doesn't need to be stru that structural. So these worked out really well. And you see, I added provisions. So eventually when I get a fiber line and it gets patched in, it's gonna come down here, right? Down and then shoot over here and plug into there, right? So uh, kind of making provisions for that. Um, so cable management, really important. Um, but there's all, way, all kinds of ways to do it on the cheap. So I think that's it. I think that's the whole, uh, the whole rack, all right? Um, I think I've covered everything. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, at least to see what I do. I know I like to watch videos just to see what other people have done because it helps me to get ideas for what I want to do. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, yeah, any, if you guys have any questions about what I've done or want more details, you know, reach out to me in the comments. I watch all the comments. I can respond to you. Um, I guess as well, if you like what you see and you like what, the, what I put out on the channel, uh, please subscribe. Uh, it helps me out. It helps the channel out. And I would greatly appreciate it. So uh, thanks again for watching. And we'll see you in the next video.